uh, again in just a few moments when we uh, look at the Word of God. But uh, I'm going to share a couple of songs with you this morning. The first one is, is really um, an older song. I like all different genres of music, uh, but whenever I play and sing, it comes out with twang, so I can't help that. But um, this is one, I believe it was written in 1958, and I think it talks about the author must have had in mind the, uh, obviously the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the fact that God said that, uh, Jesus said that the Spirit would be our comforter and our guide and will lead us and uh, bring all things um, uh, to our understanding as we study the Word of God. So if you know it, uh, feel free to sing along. I don't think I've ever done this one publicly. I did it, uh, recorded it, and shared it on Facebook, but it's called The Wings of a Dove. When trouble surrounds us, when evil comes, the body grows weak, the spirit grows numb. When these things beset us, he doesn't forget us, he sends us his love on the wings. On the wings of a snow-white dove, he sends his pure, sweet love, a sign from above. On the wings of a dove. When Noah had drifted, many days he searched for land in various ways well trouble he had some but he wasn't forgotten God sent him his love on the wings of a dove on the wings of a snow white dove he sends his pure sweet love a sign from above on the wings of a dove when Jesus went down to the river that day baptized in the usual way and when it was all done God blessed his dear son he sent him his love on the wings of a dove on the wings of a snow white dove he sends his pure sweet love a sign from above on the wings of a dove on the wings of a dove on the wings of a dove here's just a little chorus uh, I'll do and then share one more song Thank you, Lord, praise your name for the breath that I breathe. Thank you, Lord, you've been so good to me. Please keep me humble and, Lord, send me. Thank you, Lord, for saving. I needed you so bad You saved my soul and I'm so glad Please use me, Lord, that's my plea 
Let your light shine in me So the whole world can see Thank you, Lord, for saving me Well, I've been mocked when I pray But I don't care what people say Thank you, Lord, you've been so good to me please keep me humble and Lord use me thank you Lord for saving me I needed you so bad you saved my soul and I'm so Please use me, Lord, that's my plea. So let your light shine in me for the whole world to see. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. I, I didn't plan on sharing that song, but I just felt led to do it. So I'll share one more. And uh, as I told Brother John earlier, the more I sing, the shorter my sermon. So don't worry about that. Um, we read in the scriptures um, a couple times the disciples are on the Sea of Galilee and the storm uh, comes up. And, and we know one time Jesus is asleep in the boat. And, uh, of course, if you've ever been out on a, on a large body of water and a storm comes, and the waves and the wind and everything it can be <laughs> very scary very intimidating and uh, they wake Jesus up and uh, he he spoke to the storm right peace be still amen peace be still and so the principle there is we may not be uh, out on the sea in a, in a physical storm with the winds and the waves but I don't know about you, but I have storms that come in my life. <laughs> Circumstances that seem that they want to overwhelm me and uh, take me down and take me out if they could. And uh, you probably know this song. I'm not familiar with the author and when it was written, but it's called I Know the Master of the Wind. And uh, he still speaks peace to the storms that we have, all right? So if you know it, uh, feel free to sing along with me. My boat of life sailed on a troubled sea. Ever there's a wind in my sail. But I have a friend who watches over me. When the wind turns into a gale. I know the master of the wind I know the maker of the rain And he can calm the storm Make the sun shine again I know the master of Sometimes I soar like an eagle in the sky. Above the peaks my soul can be found. An unexpected storm may drive me from the heights. Well, it may bring me low, but it can never bring me down. I know the master of the wind I know the maker of the rain 
He can calm the storms, make the sun shine again. I know the master of the wind. He can calm your storm, make the sun shine again. I know the master Amen. Amen. I, I'm glad I know him today, aren't you? All right, well, give me just a second to put this up and grab my Bible. You can turn in your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 23, 2 Samuel chapter 23, and I'll be right back. Well, thank you again for the opportunity to come and uh, worship with you here at Congregational uh, PFWB in Chesapeake, Virginia. Before I uh, proceed any further, let me bring you greetings uh, from our General Superintendent, Brother Randy Carter. Um, I serve on his staff, in case you're uh, meeting me for the first time today. I serve as the uh, Regional Director of the PFWB. But uh, our headquarters are in Dunn, North Carolina, right off I-95, and so it's kind of a Kind of a semi-straight shot up here. Take 95 until you get to Emporia and turn right on 58. And it'll take you <laughs> right over in this direction. But uh, it's great to be here with you and to worship with you. I, I understand that we have another pastoral search that's getting started here at the church. So I'll be working with uh, uh, Brother John and, and the rest of your deacon board, Brother Ray, Brother Bernie, as uh, we look for uh, the minister that God has to fill this pulpit for the next season of your ministry. I, I still believe not only in, in a call from God to preach the gospel, but I believe uh, in a call to a particular pulpit at a particular time. In other words, we're praying uh, that the minister of God, that he wants to stand here, would uh, be the next one that stands here for the next season of your ministry. I heard a, a well-known uh, minister say, Dr. Erwin Lutzer, who pastored the Moody Church for, I believe, over 30 years in Chicago, about a year ago, I was at a seminar, and he said, uh, what an awesome thing, what a great uh, privilege and responsibility to be the church to represent Christ on the earth at this time. Now, we recognize we don't know the day or the hour, but the things that are taking place around us certainly indicate uh, that the coming of the Lord is near. The birth pains are getting closer ushering in the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he has us to be his church at this particular moment in time, just as Esther was called to such a time as that in the kingdom. We are called to such a time as this in God's kingdom here upon the earth. And so uh, we're going to be praying with you and, and uh, searching uh, for the one that God would have to lead this congregation, to shepherd this congregation, and to lead this congregation uh, in this critical day in which we live. I believe that God is calling us. You know, the word says to examine yourselves. Judgment begins where? Out the house of God. It begins with me, and it begins with you. And so I need to take a good look at the man in the mirror, spiritually speaking, and to do a spiritual inventory. Because if I have uh, something in my eye, how am I going to help someone else get something out of their eye? And so ministry... Uh, may look different than it did in the past, but that's okay. God moves, it seems, uh, in, in different ways and different times. But I simply want to be a part of what He is doing 
in these last days. The scripture gives us really, if you want to imagine it this way, two sides of the same coin. On one side there is a falling away. There is an apostasy that's taking place. And even um, uh, doctrine that has crept into the so-called evangelical church that is incorrect, that is not biblical doctrine, that would lead people away. But on the other side of that coin, it says there will be a great pouring out of God's Spirit. I do believe there will be a great harvest. It may not be the mass Billy Graham crusades like we used to see. It may be more like it was in the early days of Jerusalem from house to house and place here and place there. But I do believe that there's going to be a pouring out of God's Spirit that He will continue to call people into the ark of Jesus Christ until the day of His return and His judgment upon the earth. And so church, it's time for us today. And it's the title of my message really. It's to stand. We need to make sure that we stand fast, that we stand firm. We cannot compromise. The Word of God is a true and, and, and is a sure foundation. There is an absolute standard of truth. We live in a world that says there's not an absolute standard of truth. That it's relative to you and to me, and you go and search for your truth, and I'll go and search to my truth, and uh, that's okay. We can live by our own creed, so to speak. But that's not what uh, God teaches us in His Word. He said, first of all, I am the Lord and there is none else. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. That is not popular in the world today. Jesus in his day, it said he was a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And he still is today. If we're going to make a stand for Christ, there will be people who come against us simply because we preach that. But i got to tell you, what we need is not a new message. The good news is still good news today. The message does not change. The methods change. Different, uh, you know, the clothes we're wearing today, uh, the styles are different than they were 20 years ago, even though they do have a tendency to come back around, right? The cars we're driving out there today, they don't look like they did 30 years ago. And so the message, uh, the, the methods may change, but uh, things may look a little different, but the message of the Word of God does not change change we live in a world that says we want to change the message to fit our way of life and thinking but God says absolutely that the opposite of what's true you need to change your life to fit my word everything that he wanted us to know about himself and everything that he wanted us to know about how to live a life that's pleasing unto him we can find in his word in him we live and move and we have our being all things that pertain to life and godliness are found in the Word of God. And I know that sooner or later, Marty too, in and of himself, will fall flat on his face. But I'm thankful today that there is one whom we sang about a moment ago, the wings of a dove. Jesus said, it's good that I go away because I'm going to send you the promise of my Father. And that is the Holy Spirit. And so it's the Holy Spirit. Jesus gave a great mission. It's the greatest mission that's ever been given to go and preach the gospel to every creature. But you know what he said to those men who'd been with him for some three and a half years and the women too? He said, you're not ready yet. Stay in Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And so church, I need to be endued with power from on high. Not only to accomplish the mission that he's given me, but to live a life that is pleasing unto him. I can't do that in and of myself. But there's nothing that I cannot do when I have Him within me, equipping me, empowering me, helping me along the way. And I'm not even to my message yet. I forgot where I was. 2 Samuel chapter 23. I found in my preaching, I found in my preaching, unfortunately, you know, this is the part I don't plan is the best part. <laughs> and then when I get into uh, the Word, uh, I, I kind of dial it back just a little bit. I don't know. But, but anyways, church... I want to encourage you, you know, we've been through two years of a pandemic. That's really done a number on those who, who attend churches everywhere I go. Uh, many are maybe to 50% of what they were before, some a little more than that. But uh, it's, it's, it's a different day in which we live in. And we know that our faith here in America, it's an, it's, it hasn't come to, the, to gunpoint yet, but it's an all-out assault on Christianity in the United States today. This is a country whom they can rewrite history books if they want to. This is a nation that was founded upon biblical principles and values. I'm not saying that every founder was uh, personally a Christian, but it is a nation that was founded upon biblical principles and values. 
And I believe that that's why uh, for, for over 250 years of our history, God has blessed this nation. But then as we look back, excuse me, that scared me. <laughs> as we look back that, that uh, about 1950s, 60s, 70s, a lot of changes begin to take place in the world today. Some 65 uh, million children aborted in this country. Uh, so many things taking place. And I think now as a nation we are beginning to reap what we have sown for this last half century. But guess what? As we read the word throughout history, God always has a remnant. And so I don't know what it will come to in this country before Jesus comes. But I'm determined that I'm going to stand. I'm determined that I'm not going to compromise the word of truth. And I believe that He will be with me, that He will protect me if it means going to, through the waters that they will not overflow me. If it means walking through the fire, then I will not be burned because God is with me. We need to take a stand, church. And so, let me get into the Word. As we look in 2 Samuel chapter 23, if you read the heading in my Bible, that chapter, it says, David's last words. This is King David, the, the greatest king of Israel, a man after God's own heart. For 40 years he reigned, and God used him in a mighty way. But now we come to the end of his life. The first seven verses are his last words, but I want to begin in verse 8, and uh, I want to key in on verse 11 and 12. But for context, let's read about David's mighty men. These are the warriors, not only his army, but these are the elite warriors who fought under him. These are the names of the mighty men whom David had whom David had, Josh, uh, Josheb Bathshebeth, the Tachmanite, chief among the captains. He was called Adino the Esnite because he had killed 800 men at one time. And after him was Eliezer, the son of Dodo, the Ahohite, one of three mighty men with David when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle and the men of Israel had retreated. He arose and attacked the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand stuck to the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day. Remember that. The Lord brought about a great victory that day. And the people returned after him only to plunder. And now comes the main subject, uh, Shammah. And after him was Shammah, the son of Agi the Hererite. The Philistines had gathered together into a troop where there was a piece of ground full of lentils. So the people fled from the Philistines. But he stationed himself in the middle of the field, defended it, and brought about a great victory he killed the Philistines so the Lord brought about a great victory the title of the message is stand and then I kind of subtitled it uh, I know we're here in a, in a large city of Chesapeake but you go out uh, not too far and you'll find yourself in a rural area where I live is in a rural area in eastern North Carolina and so uh, you see a lot of agriculture it's a field full of lentils so I renamed it standing in a bean field. <laughs> I hope you can follow me with that. Standing in a bean field. Lord, we thank you for this time together this morning. We thank you, God, for your many blessings upon us. Lord, too many to name, too many to number all that you have done. And we're thankful, thankful this morning that we can still come to a place like this and worship you. We don't know if one day we might have to worship underground, but Lord, we are going to worship. And I pray that you would uh, Lord, draw us to you as, as we go through the message this morning, whether we've been saved for many, many years or maybe we're new on the journey of faith. I pray that your spirit would speak to our hearts wherever we may be. Draw us closer to you and may we respond in obedience and faith. And in all things, may Christ be glorified. In his name we pray. Amen. So let me get into this. These two verses, 11 and 12. Uh, I, you always want to halt when you say a short message because uh, sometimes it doesn't work out that way. <laughs> and I don't want you to hold me to that, but this is a short and simple message usually. Who was Shammah? Well, we know that he was one of David's mighty men. He was part of the elite forces of his army. If he had been in the army today, he would be a Green Beret. If he had been in the Marines, he would be part of a Marine Recon. If he was in the Navy, and here we are in a great uh, port near Norfolk, uh, where there's a naval base, he would have been a Navy SEAL. If he had been in the Air Force, I'm not sure what he would have been, <laughs> but he would have been one of the very best pilots that they had. And so uh, Shammah was one that had come and that had fought under David. 
Now, if you go back to 1 Samuel chapter 22, we see David finds himself in the cave of Adullam. He had just previously been in the palace of Saul. His gifting found him... Um, his gifting opened the door to the palace, and that was that he played the harp, and it pleased Saul. And then he became his armor bearer. He became one for that time that uh, Saul was endeared to Saul before Saul's heart turned against him. But we know that that happened, and Saul even tried to take his life. And so David goes on the run, and we know about uh, what took place with Jonathan and the arrows that he shot. And so David finds himself formerly in the palace. He's already been anointed to be king one day, but now he is in the cave of Adullam. And it says there in 1 Samuel chapter 22, verse 2, everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, everyone who was discontented gathered unto him, and he became captain over them. I call this the three Ds. This is not likely what we would call the A-team. This is the ones that we would choose first. Shammah was a part of this group. Those who were in distress, those who were in debt, and those who were discontented. This became the group that God used to raise up a mighty army in Israel. And I'm, I'm reminded of what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Not many wise according to the flesh are called. Not many mighty. Not many noble are called. This is good because it means you and I are qualified for the call of God. Because he doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. God chooses the foolish among the world, the weak and the lowly, the things that are not to bring to nothing the things that are. Why? That no flesh would glory in his presence. I remember a minister said to me that God can use anybody as long as they don't mind who gets the credit. We're worried about the credit, right? We're worried about being recognized. But there's one who sees all. What did Jesus say? My Father in heaven sees you, and he will report, he will reward you openly. So this is who Shammai was. He was one of these that gathered around David at, at, at the cave of Adullam, and the word says that David became captain over them. Well, we see very simply in verse 11 that the enemy came against them. And after him was Shammah, the son of Agi, the Hererite. The Philistines had gathered together into a troop where there was a piece of ground full of lentils. And so they'd gathered into a troop. This is a formation of soldiers. We, we recognize this morning that they were the arch enemies of the people of Israel, the Philistines. And I'm, I'm thinking, you know, we're going to make application to this message all the way through. I'm not going to make you wait till the end. The enemy comes against us, right? What did Jesus say? The thief comes to steal. To what? To kill and to destroy. First Peter 5 and 8, we read where Peter wrote under the, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. The Philistines were gathered into a troop where there was a ground full of lentils. And so I like to use my imagination and, and place uh, myself within the story when, when I'm reading uh, in the Word of God. And so if you can imagine the bird's eye view or maybe the drone, uh, the drone goes up into the air and it films everything, let's say maybe uh, two or 300 feet, and, and you're looking down, and in the middle of the picture there is a field full of lentils. This is a field that God had given to his people to provide for their needs, to provide for their food. We have not only spiritual needs that he provides for, but we have physical needs as well. He provides food both for the spiritual man and for the natural man. And so we see there's, there's some Israelites in this field. They're gathering together the beans. They're putting them in the basket. And they're getting ready when they're done to go home and cook their supper. And perhaps there's a, a wood line over here. And, and maybe they begin to hear the, the rattle and the clang of, of maybe uh, swords and spears and, and, and shields. And they look up and all of a sudden out of the wood line here comes a formation of the most fierce opponents that they have. Their enemy, the Philistines. This is probably an elite force their special forces are coming and they have now caught the people of God as it were unaware the enemy was trying to rob God's people of their blessings he was trying to rob God's people of what God had provided 
for them. We read uh, in, in Psalm 23 that there's a banquet table spread for us. And it is as if the enemy was coming against them and uh, was going to try to take everything that God has given. You know, the enemy still can't, tries to come against us, right? As a matter of fact, the more you determine that you're going to live sold out and surrender to the Lord, you can expect that the enemy will come against you even more. Because then you become a real threat. But I'm glad to know I get to the good news right now. Greater is he that's within me than he that's within the world. I'm glad to know today that you and I, if you're in Christ, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Jesus won the victory over sin, death, hell, and the grave. And by him and through him, we are victors as well. And so... The enemy tries to come and rob us. We may not be uh, standing in a literal bean field, but it could be our health. It could be our home, our relationships, our peace, uh, our, our joy. He wants uh, our employment. He wants to come and, and, and rob us of anything that God has provided. And so the enemy comes against us. Well, then we see the second scene, and the second point is this. Uh, the, the, the last part of verse 11. So the people fled from the Philistines. And so they look up, they see the, the Philistines coming into the edge of the field, and this is what they do. <laughs> they turn and they begin to run away. The people fled from the Philistines. They were giving up without what? A fight. They were giving up. They chose flight <laughs> over fight, I guess because of their fright. I'll never be able to remember that uh, again in that way. But they turned and they ran away. They were overcome with fear. Now here's really the root of the message. Because the scripture, both Old and New Testament, speaks over and over about how we are affected by fear. Uh, and, and Jesus especially ties fear into unbelief. We may not realize, I've come to an, a whole new understanding of this in the last couple of years. We may not realize how we let fear dominate our lives. We may not realize that because fear doesn't uh, come, it, it comes disguised in other ways. But if you go to the root of many of our issues, if you dig down in the ground and, and you examine it and pull that root up, what you will find is fear. Over and over in Scripture we read, do not fear. We, uh, I'm glad this recorded in 2 Timothy 1 and 7. God has not given us a spirit of what? Of fear but of power, that is the power of God. And of love, that is the love of God. It's agape, it's a love that the world can't understand until they know Him. And of a sound mind of self-discipline. And so we understand in another use of the word fear that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We can understand that kind of fear, but you see, this is a different kind of the fear. This is a fear of, of, of something that would come against me, it's going to take me out, I'm worried about it. I'm anxious about it. And God said, I did not give you a spirit of fear. That does not come from the Lord. But how many times do we either allow fear to paralyze us from action or to simply make us turn around and run away? Fear can come in so many forms. I'll just name a few. Fear of defeat. Fear of rejection is a big one. Fear of our own inability that we do not measure up. And so we look now at our bird's eye view and we see the, the, the Philistines are coming further into the field and, and, the, and the Israelites are, are, are running out the other side. But yet we see there is one person that's still facing the Philistines. Perhaps he turned around and is like, where are y'all going? <laughs> but he didn't run. And this is the subject of these two verses, his name is Shama. It says there, he stationed, in verse 12, he stationed himself in the middle of the field. And I'm telling you, church, this is what we have to do today in the world that we are living in. We cannot allow the enemy to put us to flight. We cannot allow the compromise that's creeping in the church allow us uh, to, to, to settle uh, and, and to make deals with the enemy, so to speak. We have to make a stand. It says here, he took his stand in the midst of the plot. I like that. And he made a decision. I can't, I'm not inside of Shama's mind, but I think maybe his, his thinking went something like this. Live or die, here I stand. 
And that is the attitude that I want to have. Lord, when the enemy comes against me, when the world comes against me, and tries to, uh, to, to, to change your word, and tries to change what you have said, Lord, help me to react this way. Live or die, here I stand. Shammah was thinking, I'm not going out with my back to the enemy. I'm not going to let the enemy steal what God has taken from me. And so church, we need to make a decision right now. When the enemy comes against us, what are we going to do? Are we going to run away or are we going to make a stand? You know, there's going to be some tough choices in this country. People are going to, 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 it's coming, and and even now it has crept in. People are going to have to make decisions because of their faith that are going to cause them to be fired from their jobs. That's just one, that's just one example. But can you imagine how losing your job will have such an effect on your life? You've still got bills coming in. You've still got mouths to feed and stomachs that get hungry. Now we know that God never abandons his children, and he will always make a way where there seems to be no way. But I'm telling you, as this world, as the U.S. grows further and further away from God, it's going to cost the people of God more to make a stand for him. But I'm glad to report to you this morning that wherever the, the, the church has been persecuted, the church has been on fire for God. You know what? You just go back to the, to the book of Acts and, and how when, uh, you remember uh, Peter and John and, and how they came before the Sanhedrin and, and they, were, they were told uh, after the healing of the lame man, Uh, And all the people had seen, this man has laid here year after year after year, and now he is standing up, leaping and praising God. There's no doubt that a miracle had taken place. And so those of the Sanhedrin said, well, we can't kill Peter and John. We can't, they had thrown them in jail, but they said we can't leave them in jail. So they said this, I, uh, no more will will you preach, do not preach anymore in the name of Jesus. Do not preach anymore. And what did they say? Whether it be right in the sight of God or man, You decide. We cannot but speak the things that we have seen and heard. They took a stand. They took a stand. We cannot but speak the thing, church, that we have seen and heard. The the Scripture is full of people making stands. David and Goliath, one of the greatest stands. I recently reread that, and, and, and as they actually walked out onto the battlefield, Goliath and David uh, began to exchange some words. And then when the words were over, what did David say? Oh, what did he do? Of course, we know that he had a sling and he had the stone and the five stones, but he took one. And then it said he ran toward Goliath. I missed that part before. <laughs> I must have missed that in Sunday school. I forgot it. He ran toward his enemy. Why? Because he went in the power of God. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. We know the story about Nebuchadnezzar and the image that had been raised and how the people were supposed to bow and to worship and they would not. What did they say? Our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us, O king, but if not. I love those words. But if not, I'm still making a stand. But if not, I'm not going to give in. But if not, I'm not going to compromise. But if not, I know that my God is the one true God and He is with me and He is in me and He's going to give me victory over you one way or the other. But if not, let it be known to you, O King, that we do not serve your gods nor will we worship the gold image that you have set up. You know, it's not as obvious as this in our culture, but there's a lot of golden images that are being set up that people are worshiping, that people are bowing to. The, 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 and I'm talking about our culture, our pop culture. And so the scripture is full of people making a stand. How about uh, some uh, six, 600 years ago, Martin Luther made a stand in 1521 at the Diet of Worms. You remember, he had come against the abuses of the Catholic Church. He nailed his 95 Theses to the, to the church door. And uh, he was brought before the council, threatened with his life. And he said, my conscience is held captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. You see, here I stand. God is looking for people in his church today to say, here I stand. It's not my opinion. It's what God has said. It's the word of God. It's the word of God. Ephesians 6.13, 
I'm coming in for a landing, as they say. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to what? To stand. And then the next verse, stand, therefore, having your loins girded with the truth, the breastplate of righteousness, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, and the sword of the Spirit. He says, I'm giving you what you need. We don't send our soldiers out on the battlefield unless we've trained them and unless we've equipped them. God said, I will train you. I will equip you. I will give you everything that you need. But the human will is involved. You must make a stand. And when you make a stand, I will be that overcoming power and strength within you against anything that you will face. God is saying, do not fear. Just trust in me. For you do not stand alone. I am with you. What about a young Joshua as he's getting, can you imagine replacing Moses? I mean, this is Moses. Come on. I mean, he, Moses is so great, they, they chose Charlton Heston to play him. <laughs> and so, he's got to replace Moses. This is the man, of course we know it was God who did all this, but this is the man who led uh, some two million people across the Red Sea. Uh, just amazing. And, and so I would feel pretty inadequate if I were uh, Joshua, and I think he probably did. But what is that in Joshua 1.9, I believe? This, this is maybe not an exact quote, but God said to Joshua, what are you doing, son? Have, that's, the, that's the Eastern North Carolina version. He said, have not I commanded you? Be strong and courageous. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Wherever you go. Isaiah 41.10, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And so, what we see is the enemy comes against them. Uh, the people run away. One man makes a stand, and he stands on the word. And what happens, the final point is verse 12. And God brings the victory. Read that verse, that last sentence of that verse. So the Lord brought about a great victory. Now, I find that interesting because it, it's Shammah in the field, right? And he's the one that's actually fighting these Philistines. And he's the one that kills them. But it doesn't say Shammah brought about a great victory. It says the Lord brought about a great victory. Who deserves the credit? It is the Lord. This is the lesson that God had been teaching His people over and over again. If we go back to the Exodus and coming out of Egypt in Exodus 14 and 14, what did God say? I will fight for you. I will fight for you. He is still the Lord my banner. Do you remember when, when Joshua was fighting the Amalekites and then you have Moses up on the hill and as long as he had his, his arms raised, the people began. What is, that, what is that showing us? It is the power of God. It is God fighting our battles. And so, yes, He calls us to walk out on the battlefield. He calls us, spiritually speaking, to pick up our five rocks and to take our sling. But what does He say? If you will just be obedient unto Me, then I'm going to take care of all the rest. I'm going to take care of all the rest. There's no enemy that we face that is greater than He is. I face a lot of enemies that are greater than I am, but there's no enemy that I face that is greater than the God that we serve. And so the lesson is this, nothing is impossible with God. I love that verse. Nothing, that means, and, and we see this, put it this way too, all things are possible with God. There's a song, uh, a newer song, maybe a few years old, uh, a worship, a contemporary worship song, and it says this, it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. <laughs> It may look like I'm surrounded. It may look like the enemy is all around me, 360 degrees, and there's no way I can run or anything I can do uh, to win the battle or to escape. But really what the enemy needs to realize is they are all surrounded by the God who is greater than they are. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by Him who is all-knowing and all-powerful and everywhere. It's Jesus that brings the victory through His death, burial, and resurrection he won the victory over death, hell, and the grave over every enemy that would come against us. And so, church, His victory is our victory. His victory is our victory. You know, we see, we see something like a Daniel in the lion's den. We see a miraculous deliverance, right? 
But then we see like uh, Stephen, the first martyr in the New Testament. He, he was killed for his faith. Well, guess what? The God of the miraculous was with them both. He was giving them both strength. It's just the cup that you have been called to is going to be a cup different than I have been called to. But whatever his plan and purpose is for my life, I want to be true to that. I want to please him with my life. You know, I'm, I'm uh, 48 years old now, and I, I recognize that the older, I, the, the young people think I'm old, right? And then, and then the older people, they say, oh, you're still young. <laughs> so so uh, I'm somewhere in the middle. But I do realize this. In two years, I'll be half a century. Actually less, a year and a half. I want to make the most of the time that I have left to serve my God and my King. That's all I want to do. I want to do. Don't, don't, do, don't get me wrong. I, I still deal with self, and every day self has to be nailed again to the cross, right? It's got to be nailed again. Whenever self tries to rear its ugly head, just stomp on it and say, no, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And I want that to be first and foremost in my life today. And so, church, I, I, I just thank you this morning for, uh, you've been with me during this, and I just pray that uh, me and you and together as a church that we would just make a stand and be encouraged. I want you to be encouraged I know the master of the wind. And right now, I might not see any sunshine. I might see uh, waves that are above my head. I've been out on the ocean one time, and at that moment, I said, I'm never going deep sea fishing again in my life. I never would have cut it in the Navy. I won't, I won't land under my feet. But I've seen it when, when the waves were higher than the boat and the wind, and oh my goodness circumstances we go through like that sometimes seem so bad, so awful, that we're never going to see the sun shine again. But you know what? Jesus can come, and even in the midst of all that, even in the midst of the storm, while it's still raging, we're not alone. We're not alone. He's with us. He's in the boat. He said, why did you fear? Didn't you know that I am with you? And when the time is right, He will bring peace to that situation. So I, I, I'm not sure who, maybe I'm speaking to many, but I want you to know right now, Jesus is with you, number one. So you don't have to fear what's going on around you. And number two, he's going to bring peace. And that peace begins in here. And then, like the ripple effect, we see that he brings peace uh, in all those circumstances we've been facing. So if you would stand with me, stand with me as we close with a word of prayer. If there's, if there's someone here today who, who would like to be prayed for here at the altar, then uh, you, you're welcome to come at this time, and I'll be glad to pray with you. Let me say this as I close. The greatest news that's ever been given, you can go ahead and come if, if you'd like prayer. The greatest news is this, that he who knew no sin became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus paid a debt he did not owe because I and you, we owed a debt that we could not pay. And so he came. This is, this is not just a story. This is the truth. He came, the sinless Lamb of God. He went to Calvary's cross in our place. There he died. They laid him in the tomb, and we know the third day he rose again. And he said this. Whoever calls, the scripture says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I pray that you have that uh, relationship today. If not, don't leave this place without that relationship. But uh, I'm going to set the mic down and begin to pray. I don't know if you have the capability of playing any music softly, but that's just up to you. But we're going to pray. And uh, if you need to go, then if you would just go quietly. But we're going to take a few moments to pray. And uh, as, as I pray, let's just, let's just all pray together. And I'll go and pray with each one of you and ask God that he, however he's moved in, in your life in this message today, just respond to him in obedience and faith in Jesus' name.